Hi everyone, welcome to the Vancouver Art Book Fair. It is the last program of the day. Um, thank you for everyone if you're tuning into the whole day or if you're just joining us. Um, my name is Vivian Sming um, and I publish artist books through Sming Sming Books and I'm the guest curator for this year's virtual program. Um, and before we begin, I wanna acknowledge that the Vancouver Art Book Fair takes place on the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and um, Tsleil-Waututh nations. And I'm streaming here from my home in the Bay Area on the land of the Mwakma Ohlone people. Um, and as we are here to talk about books and publishing, I also wanna acknowledge the many histories and languages that have been erased um, through the prioritization of paper as being the source of history, legitimacy, and um, value. Um, many of you know these themes, um, the programs, um, presenters have spoken to today. Um, and so I wanted to offer these programs as a way to understand how publishing and how books can really be a site of resistance, restoration, contestation, and imagination. Um, so thanks again for joining us. Um, this next program is actually a pre-recording co-presented by Grunt Gallery in Vancouver. And it's an interview and walkthrough of Marlene Yuen's um, exhibition, Cheap, Diligent Faithful, which is on view through December 12th at um, Grant Gallery, so you can go and check that out. Um, Vancouver-based printmaker Marlene Yuan's um, exploration of Chinese-Canadian labor histories have through the years taken the form of intricately produced print and paper-based media. Drawing from oral histories and archival research inspired by Yuan's own family history, Cheap, Diligent Faithful acknowledges the complexities of labor and immigration in this country and lifts up the small remarkable details of lived experience. Um, the exhibition includes a launch of Marlene's new publication that explores the graphic and cultural history of Ho Sung Hing printers, which closed in um, 2014 after 106 years of business in Vancouver's Chinatown. Um, and Marlene also has a table at um, Vancouver Art Book Fair, so um, feel free to go check that out. Um, Marlene is a Vancouver-based artist who received her Bachelor's of Studio Arts in 1998 from the University of British Columbia. She has exhibited at galleries, artist-run centers, and cultural events in Canada, United States, United Kingdom, Belgium, and Japan. Her main focus is on handmade books using printmaking processes. Her books have been retained in special collections nationally and internationally. Um, so with that, here is the pre-recording. Hello, welcome to this talk. Uh, we come to you from the past in a pre-recorded state. Um, and it is uh, a rainy day in September and we are here at Emily Carr in the printmaking room. Um, my name is Vanessa. I'm here with Wes Harmon and Marlene Ewan. Um, and we are um, here on behalf of an exhibition at Grunt of Marlene's work. Um, and this is a talk that is presented by the Vancouver Art Book Fair and Grunt Gallery. Uh, before we get started, I want to acknowledge that we are coming to you from the unceded ancestral territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh Nation. Um, and today, as every day, we acknowledge and we pay our respects to the indigenous um, traditional owners of this land uh, who have been in good relation with the land and water uh, for millennia, and we hope to work towards that. We should jump in to uh, what we're going to talk about today. Uh, Marlene is going to do a demo here, uh, and then we're, all, we're also going to move over to the gallery to do an exhibition tour. But before we get into that, maybe just a brief few words from each of you about who you are and how you're related to this project, Wes. Yeah, uh, so my name is Wes Harmon. I work at Grunt Gallery, um, doing a variety of projects, mostly together apart and helping with Marlene's exhibition. Um, although I'd also like to acknowledge that like Case Slater, our uh, exhibition preparator, who is not in this room with us, was a huge pr part of making that exhibition happen. We'll see more of that later. Um, yeah, and I'm an artist as well. Um, I'm also another presenter for the Vancouver Art Book Fair, so you'll see me in another video with Brandy Bird, um, either later or before, whenever the schedule, <laughs> however that falls. Uh, and as I said, I'm Vanessa. My uh, 
well, Vanessa Kwan, uh, I'm the program director at Grant, and uh, Wes and I have been working to co-organize this show uh, with Marlene, and of course the incredible support of Kay. Marlene. I'm Marlene, I'm a Vancouver-based artist, printmaker, and I also work here at Emily Carr as a technician, so very lucky to have access to special equipment such as the Blotter Press. I've been making books for a very long time, well, feels like a long time, 2004, and I learned how to use the letterpress on the residency back in 2009, and it's been great to carry on this skill craft in my new book, Hosun in Printers, which is a cold publication with the Grant Council. I guess my first question, um, I mean, you've mentioned a little bit about how you came to printmaking, but um, I wondered how you how you how you found the Ho Sung Hing printers as a uh, subject matter and what attracted you to this. We had a lead that there was a print shop in Chinatown that was about to close down, and we needed to acquire more equipment for this room because a lot of press equipment is very hard to come by these days. So we went on a small field trip and um, full of all these little type, there's uh, these letterpress cuts. So I ended up buying a few just because they're very cool and I'll show you back in the gallery. Um, but it's like when I bought them, it was this was seven years ago, 20, no wait, 2014, they closed 20, but they had a sale in 2013. And um, so I bought these cuts and I thought it'd be great to reprint them somehow one day. And but the idea just was just sat on the back burner, and um, knowing that Emily Carr also acquired some letterpress type, um, I thought one day it'd be great to merge all these elements and make a book about the print shop itself, which um, served the Chinatown community for over 100 years. Yeah, I remember seeing some news articles when uh, the print shop closed in 2014, and it was in business for 106 years, is Correct. that right? Yeah. Correct. And it was the oldest print shop in Canada at the time? Uh, oldest Chinese English print shop. Okay. Yeah, because they had a Chinese type, which they actually went on overseas trips just to acquire the different typefaces. And you did interviews with some of the folks at, at Hosang? Yes, uh, I interviewed uh, Norman Lamb, and uh, he gave me some insight about the workings of the family business. and. Um, they mostly printed invoices and like menus and very practical print items for uh, mostly the Chinatown community, but also beyond. They did business cards and they have various presses. Like uh, just being able to see the shop before it closed was pretty like special. Like it was uh, this giant inside. They had all this equipment and piles of paper. Like it's it was. It's like you're in a time warp. <laughs> Very cool. I think um, a question that I had leading from that, um, so you're working with letterpress, with, which historically is something that had a very practical usage, um, like very utilitarian, um, but now you're taking this process and moving it more into a contemporary form that is elevating it up to an art. Um, and you mentioned in a previous conversation just um, kind of the reaction or like non-reactions and I just wonder what it's like to navigate that and to be making this book and kind of having these two different attitudes about how to use this one machine. It's a great question. Um, I got, making this book, I, I felt like I need to emulate the labor again of typesetting and using type and because otherwise I, What's the point of making this book? I thought, like, without if I didn't use the letterpress, um, but also it became something precious. Like this book was put together; it was very like you know thought out, design. You know, it, it's the main purpose was just to be a book. And when the book was finished, I contacted Norman, and the book is ready, and I have a copy waiting for you, and didn't get a response back. So I, you know, he, I kind of felt like after a couple co conversations with Norman that they were mentally done with the shop. You know, they were, you know, he's retired, he's enjoying his life at 
retired printer and um, I think they just they saw the print shop as a very practical way of working and you know um, they, they didn't really understand so much the uh, this book like um, as being a art art basically art book you know I guess um, for me when I think about having access to like um, historical objects and in this case it's like the letterpress and the type itself um, I just wonder like how does it feel to be working with something that you have put so much preciousness and into in understanding um, I, yeah, I think there's something really special about being able to take something that could have been discarded um, and seem kind of inconsequential at the time, um, but maybe like on a emotional level, like feels quite different. Like, did you feel like quite emotional working with the type and with the book yeah. itself? Yeah, I felt it's very meaningful. I noticed a lot of people were buying these the blocks, the cuts, and more like as a souvenir, mm -hmm. you know, to take away as like piece of Chinatown because at the time like so much like so much of Chinatown and is still changing right now. Um, but I said these are blocks, they're meant to be reprinted. Yeah. And if I could just sh show it in the form of a book, well that's the medium I'm quite used to working with right now, then just being able to reprint them felt really special. And I was able to access um, Chinese blocks from We Press because they acquired quite a bit of the Chinese blocks and type from Ho Sun Hing and rescued it and it's so they have quite a bit and I must manage to borrow and print and scan the prints so it's been it's been a good process. It's interesting to think about um, that moment when the print shop closed and then it was it, sub it loses its um, containment. Everything starts traveling in different yeah. directions and you lose that, that thing, that special thing, that whatever it was. And it, it was a practicality, it was a business, it was something, it was an institution. And then it sort of dissipates and I, I wondered about, I mean, I think about you and that kind of impulse to create something with those blocks to, um, I mean, in some ways, I, from what I hear, it feels like it's an honoring of those, of the life that they had, those blocks had in the print shop, but also, a new thing it, it lifts it up into your own practice and so I, I wondered what your hopes are for the book how do you see the book operating what is it um, what do you hope it's doing I hope it honors the lamb family's business ultimately because it's such a you know in this very digital world these things seem very obsolete now and because they were um, a Chinese English print shop they, they had like an edge they had they, they had a Chinese type and it was just a lot you know it's a long family labor and if just reprinting it just I want to show them that um, I honor and respect you know the service that they provided and community in Chinatown, which is you know is quickly changing and being gentrified, and in times of COVID, it's you know things are even closing down even more. Mm -hmm. So, well, no, I think also in context of the rest of the show, which we'll see a little bit later, there is uh, an overall thread through your work around documenting these histories, these, these Chinese Canadian labor histories in Canada, and I think. Um, yeah, it feels like this is very much within that, that vein of your practice. Very much so, and I want to focus on um, a local industry. Um, a lot of the pieces that you see in the show are like about Chinese Canadians in Ontario and Alberta, and because the show actually a lot of pieces were previously shown in Ontario at the Workers' Arts and Heritage Center, which is a, a labor museum. So a lot of it, I kind of tried to appeal to the crowd back east, but now I really want to think about you know, industry here and how Chinatown is quickly just 
it feels like it's disappearing, you know, it's just, and if I could just save a little bit, even if it's just a form of a book, like, that would mean a lot. Uh, I was just thinking about um, how you're saying that having the Chinese English type gave them an edge as printmakers. Um, it just made me think a lot about uh, different kind of print projects and the language projects that have been coming up in the last couple of years, especially with the younger Chinese community, um, which is really exciting. So for me, looking at your book is kind of, um, uh, as someone who has more experience as a printmaker, like I think a lot of the younger folks kind of coming up through zines and other art book projects right now are like gonna be really excited to see this and see the possibilities of like how these things can be consolidated together. Um, yeah, I'm just really excited. And like oh. I've seen the book and it's beautiful and oh. I think people Thank you. also think so. Um, yeah, and also, uh, younger people <laughs> like, like, were involved in this book where I had the Chinese text translated by um, Jody Mock of the Yarrow Intergenerational Society and she's, you know, when you think about all the, how Chinatown seems to be disappearing, there is a youth group that is trying so hard to, you know, keep things alive in Chinatown and they assist elders by like translation mm -hmm. like you know let's say we press they have open studios but um they the translators help the elders in translating the activities so there is some hope you know i mean covid right now is tough but mm -hmm. yeah and there is so much value in still having like these translation relationships happening um like when we were doing uh the blockades at Clark and Hastings, uh, Jane Shi, Rachel Lau, Evie Chong, like they were all working to translate a lot of the protest signs for the elders so that yes. they at least knew what was happening because it was something happening in their community. Um, so it's, yeah, it's just really, it feels like something that doesn't get enough credit for its importance. Exactly. Um, and that's what I really loved about your project is like elevating and like honoring like this history behind the need for translating. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. It's funny because printmaking is like something that people want to think about as like a mass production, but actually there's such an incredible intimacy to like the placement of the text and just the labor that you put in as the artist. And also, I think especially in the in the in the case of the Ho Sun Hing printers, um, materials going to places like We Press where there is a real desire to to uh, to create connection and to create more opportunity for community building through these I won't call them artifacts I guess they're sort of their belongings you know and so um, yeah I think there's something just it's, it's nice to think about what you're talking about that capturing of like the new life and the new elements of change that are happening and how youth are really taking that up and where your practice sits in, in the middle of that. Uh, we are now over at Grant Gallery. Uh, so we moved over from the printmaking studio at Emily Carr, um, and we're now in our space across the street. Um, Marlene's show is called Cheap, Diligent, Faithful, and it's on view here until December 12th, 2020. So if you are viewing this at the back of our book fair, we're open right now and we're welcoming people to our space. Um, we will also be making a number of the works in the show available digitally uh, on our website, which is grant.ca. We'll also post a bunch of URLs at the end of this video. Um, and so yeah, we will, we're just going to take you on a tour of the exhibition. Uh, one of the things I do want to talk about, of course, is that was on the famous book, um, but also uh, to acknowledge that this, this exhibition includes a number of the works as a bit of a retrospective. Um, and I think there's, a, there's some really beautiful threads pulled around the relationship between the work that you did with the Printer's book and how you've documented these labor histories over time. So I wonder if you could just give us a quick overview of what we're looking at and then we'll go a bit more in depth. Absolutely. Uh, you know what you would notice right away are the pieces on the walls. And um, they were, this is just about half of what was uh, shown at the Workers' Arts and Heritage Museum uh, in 2017. Um, so there's various labors uh, that are depicted. Uh, 
Chinese restaurant, uh, new grocer, laundry mat, and um, just, these are just some of the various labors taken on by Chinese in early Canada. And another thing that the museum wanted was some new books and uh, created specifically for the exhibits. So um, Korean books are, they exhibit very well as they stretch out. So I chose to do a book about a railroad worker and uh, a female uh, military worker, Mary Kobong. So um, it's a real uh, step to translate what you're doing on the page into uh, a larger gallery show. And um, I think that process is something I think we'd like to talk about as well. And I know Wes has some questions about that. So. One of the main questions I had about your comics, because when we were in the process of putting the show together, you did send us all of them. And what I was really taken by was just the amount of research that has been put into them. Um, there is just so much content and like to be able to take that content and boil it down into a comic, which sort of is a way of abbreviating that information so that it becomes more palatable. Um, I guess my main question from this is, uh, did you feel like there were things that you kind of lost in that process or things that you felt like were elevated better? And yeah, just that process of curating down your research because I know it's easy to get lost in research holes. Uh, in projects like these? Definitely. I was incredibly overwhelmed. There's so much. I was at one point overwhelmed by what I should include. Had I, in retrospect, I could have just chosen to do a whole exhibit on Chinese laundry or Chinese grocery, but um, I basically felt like I scratched, just scratched the surface onto the you know, choosing what stories to show. These are all real people and the things in real lives. So I feel, feel like it's just, these are just little snapshots of, um, of these histories that, are, that happen. And why I chose the comic format was uh, it was shown at the Workers' Arts and Heritage Museum and there's a large amount of uh, youth education so I thought that some of these labors are, you know, there's a lot of racism which is um, shown in the comics. How do you translate these difficult histories that to an audience that you know, they can digest? So having it as a comic it's just seemed like a way to kind of reach out and invite viewers to you know, read on. Hmm. I think it's really, um like it works so well in moving this into youth education, but I think also as adults, like there's something a lot of us can really appreciate about not having to read another essay, which I'm sure all of us have done ad nauseum, um, but to also have these images to go along with it. Like there's so much that can be expressed in them, um, particularly the two comics that we've kind of panned through in these last uh, couple of shots, but like of the mothers of the children, like there's so much energy in these things that you just wouldn't be able to translate as easily to essays. Um, so a question from that, I suppose, is uh, have you felt like there's been a reaction kind of like intergenerationally, and has that been a talking point for people to start those conversations? Definitely. Actually, I did give a talk to um, elders that were bus in, in Toronto, and it was a talk I gave the talk in English, but there was a, it was translated in Mandarin, and um, a lot of the elders were, even though they could not read the text, they can see, and they were very touched. This one very elderly woman came up to me and said, thank you. She was like, she came up to me and thanked me for sharing, for, thank you for sharing our stories. And just seeing it, like, here, that almost made me cry. I mean, it was just very emotional, you know, just like, it meant so much for her, and then um, even there were some youth from York University at the time, and they said they did not know about the railroad. They did not know, and so it was like a lot of people kind of took it differently. Yeah, yeah. it's really. Um, I mean, usually when we're handling comics, we're holding something that's uh, small and literally can fit within our hands, and the other 
big question I had because uh, we have this big mural of the reproduction of uh, Hosung King printers. Um, what has it been like for you to be doing these comics that are small scale and then blowing them up and then taking this mural? And, like, oh, it's not to scale, I don't think quite, but like it's definitely kind of like reconstructing this space once again. Um, and it's beautiful. And uh, I'm sure also emotional to be seeing your work in a larger scale as well. Uh, it is emotional because like this place, if you were to look at 259 East Georgia Street now, it doesn't look like this. It's all charcoal gray. It's uh, very much abandoned. It's like Chinatown now. It's, now look at this, this is vibrant. This is like, a, it was a place that was working for over a hundred years and people patronized it. And, but so to see it very much in color is, um, and no, it's not quite scale, but it, you know, I, I did a play on space, like uh, you know, this doorway would be from where their door would be. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's something to, like what you say about the colors, like the, it's kind of like rebuilding this life back into something where if we go and look at the actual location now, um, a lot of the story of Chinatown is about gentrification, about this really big shift in the neighborhood. Um, but here there's such a like exuberance and like gentleness and care in it that really comes through um, both in this work and in the actual publication itself. Yeah, I just feel like I had to show that these were vibrant places and using these colors was really important. I just had it. I'm, at the time when printing of the books, Image is very much based on the front cover of the book. Um, there's only certain colors you can print on the riso uh, through Monica Press, who I know do the riso press printing. So um, I just wanted to be a very bright and cheerful book, and um, the pages of the paper were not like none of those pieces of page, paper were precious. Like a lot of books now are, ex with the exception of a letter press. Having that the colorfulness was to trying to translate the once vibrant neighborhood and now it's just changing. You know, just times are changing and it's been very difficult to stop. But this is a little bit like a time warp. Woo! We have the seafoam green. Um, so Marlene, you've talked a little bit about how important it was for you to include um, women's stories as well. Um, and so one of the ones that really is striking in the show is this, is this particular piece uh, about Mary Kovong. So maybe just take us through what we're looking at here. Yes, so uh, just through my research, I found that uh, it was very much predominantly male in a bachelor society. So I was like, ah, change that. There's, there's, there are strong female figures. And through the Veterans Archives, Veterans Canada, um, I discovered um, Mary Kovong and she was very excited to serve in World War II. She enlisted before her two brothers, and she trained in Hamilton. She ended up being an optics mechanic, so fixing tools and instruments like uh, compasses and um, lenses. So uh, she was just a very strong figure, and she also end up entertaining and singing and dancing in the war as well. So after her training, um, she just ended up continuing her study of, uh, through her, um, she just ended up studying horology, which is the study of time. So like she was fixing watches and clocks. And like she was the first female Chinese Canadian to do so, to finish that program. So I feel like she's a very noteworthy character and she was very, I, she was described as very plucky and independent. So how could I not include her? Yeah, totally. Um, one thing I had a question about around your own process and how you, how you engage with these stories. I know, you know, printmaking is such a physical activity. It really is about involving your own body and your hands in this 
labor of creating these images, and I, I wondered, do you identify with these subjects? Do you feel like, you know, what does that play a role for you in kind of recording these histories as your own relationship to that labor and to their story, and how does that interplay for you? I felt it was very much important to screen print these books because uh, uh, it's a very physical uh, process, screen printing. You're using your upper body strength, you're just like sometimes sweating and so and things don't go right the first time. So I feel like it is, it was very important for me to show that no, to screen print, physically do this, and have it shown in this work as a, as a translation, like my labor and respect and honoring of their labor. Uh, so we're just at the last piece in this exhibition, um, which is the new book that you produced to go along with this exhibition. Um, we're just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that, because it's something you mentioned you started eight years ago-ish? Yes. Yeah. Uh, let's start. I was at Ho Sun Hain's uh, closing out sale, and it lasted for a while. I couldn't help myself but buy these little blocks. A lot of people were buying these letterpress blocks, and they're actually called letterpress cuts. Uh, they're just really beautiful objects. So I thought an idea. One day I would reprint these. Back then, it was like 20. 2013, like, so I had the idea that like, one day I would like to reprint them because that's what they're made for. But a lot of people were just buying them as souvenirs. You know, so the store was historical. The store was closing, and they wanted a part of the shop. But uh, I was like, these are letterpress blocks, and I'm a letterpress printer, so it made sense that one day I would reprint them. And I thought about retelling the family story because being such a long-lived business, like there was so much history. And so I, it just got the ball rolling. I contacted the Lamb family and got their permission to tell the story and I interviewed Norman Lamb. I, he told me about a photograph that was very special um, to his family and that's included in the interview. And I managed also to make connection with we Press, who they own, um, they saved a lot of the Chinese types and blocks, and I managed to borrow them, and I reprinted them, but and then scanned the imagery, so it is included in the pages. But uh, they were the, I also ended up hiring a translator from. Uh, Yarrow Intergeneration of Society, uh, Jody Mock, and she was amazing. She just translates all this Chinese text, and it's, it's quite interesting what some of these blocks say. So, um, you know, it's quite a process uh, getting permissions and just being really respectful to the family. So, the book has gone through so many different processes, and you've also worked with Moniker Press, uh, which is the Brazil Printing Press that now is in. In what building in Chinatown? Um, and then we're also taking it as a gallery and digitizing it. Um, so, all of this labor, now that you're kind of coming to a finish, close to the finish of it, how does it feel to be ready to set that down? It feels great. I am so happy that this publication is very close to being finished. Uh, second printing is being worked on as we speak. You know, some of these blocks that are, were so tiny, they couldn't be just reproduced as is, so I found that like, I had to somehow show them in a way that would be very graphic. So working with Erica at Monica Press was great, because she, you know, Rizo is so bright and remind me of a print shop, all these various different colors of yeah, just like I felt like this book involves so many people and so many organizations and just getting permission to print. Um, so this is probably a good place to plug your book. Uh, the okay. book is available on grunt.ca. Uh, 
can be purchased through our web shop there. And if you have any questions about it, you can get in contact with us at the gallery. And if there are really in-depth questions, we will ask Marlene. Um, yes. Thank you so much for joining us for this public talk. And thank you, Marlene, for walking us through your exhibition. Um, I know it's a strange thing to have an exhibition right now, and I really hope like stuff like this can help bring people into the space. And again, we will be open until December 12th. Thanks everyone for tuning in to the Vancouver Art Book Fair's first day of programs. Um, I'm told there are hashtags and handles on my right, which you can follow, post, use um, to participate in all of the fair's activities. It's hashtag VABF virtual. Um, and I just want to take a moment to give a huge thank you to Katayun Youssef um, Bijlou, who has done all the tech magic today, um, which is really just a bunch of hard work and like <laughs> talent and skill. Um, so thank you also to the Vancouver Art Book Fair team, Lisa Curry, Erica Wilk, and Helen Wong, and all of the ASL interpreters, and just everyone behind the scenes who have really worked hard to create this fair. Um, it's just a tremendous feat to pivot what would have been an in-person fair to an online virtual one. And so, you know, you've all done such an amazing job. Um, and thanks for having me and for the invitation to organize this program. Um, the fair website will be live throughout the weekend at VancouverArtBookFair.com. Um, please check back in tomorrow for another full day of presentations, including talks by Clara um, Balagar and Ken Lum and Camila Janan Rashid, Demian Dinayaji, and many others. Um, please also support the fair by signing up to be a member. It's super affordable. Um, it's a way to keep it free and accessible. Um, thanks, everyone. Have a good night and go check out some tables. Bye.